Well, thank you for continuing on with me. Uh, yesterday we talked about how that Abraham was tested to prove the sincerity, the genuineness of it, the purity of his faith. And what that resulted in was an improvement in his faith that he had a deeper knowledge and understanding of God and his ways. And I think that as unattractive as that may seem to many of us, the truth of the matter is that's what God is doing in your life and my life all the time. He's putting us in situations where we have to make choices. Will we trust God or not trust God? Will we submit to his word or not submit to his word? Will he obey his commands or not obey his commands? And uh, that's not easy. I don't want to even pretend that it's easy. In fact, one of the things that uh, Peter says to us is the tendency is for us to think that's strange. And it's interesting when he says, thinking that something strange has happened to you, uh, the word used here, seinos, means in, in Hebrew, in the Greek, literally means an unusual, out of the ordinary, unexpected thing. In other words, it's often, I didn't see that one coming. And how many times in your life have you <laughs> entered into something and suddenly realized, I didn't see that coming? I think about remodeling. I remember the last time we remodeled our house and I decided if I ever have to remodel my house, I think I'll just burn it to the ground and start all over. Uh, no, remodeling is harder than just building in the first place because you have to undo before you can redo. And so it's twice the work and oftentimes three times the money. But what was really interesting is, is as you open up walls and you made saw what had been done, the previous construction, you realized that oftentimes builders make shortcuts. They, they figure out ways to do what they do a little cheaper. And after the sheet rocks up and painted, you know, you can't really tell. But when you get in there to make changes, you realize that wasn't quite done up to code or the way it should have necessarily been done. And so that's where we find ourselves um, really wondering, how did I get myself into this? What did I bite off? Uh, I remember when I had my rotator cuff surgery years ago and I had fallen on it and that had aggravated the, the injury. But uh, the, the, the surgeon who, who did the work, uh, you know, of course he put me out and uh, uh, and then he gave me a little disc with, with uh, the video of the surgery on it so I could see what he had done. And so as soon as I got home, I stuck it, stuck it in my computer and I started playing it. And he starts explaining what he's going to do. And the very next thing out of his word was, oh, dude, this is not good. <laughs> I'm glad I heard that after the surgery and not before it. But the whole point is that... <clears throat> Even though I had the MRIs and all this kind of stuff, it was a lot worse than he had anticipated that it was going to be because he, only until he gets in there can he actually see how much damage had been done. <clears throat> well, today, that's my, that's my good shoulder, man. That's my strongest shoulder. So he did a great job. But he says, you know, we, we have to understand that, uh, that God is going to take us through those things and they're not going to, and oftentimes they're not going to be welcome. We're not going to say, oh, I'm glad this is happening until we come to a place where we begin to understand God's greater purpose. Now, if we go back to Genesis and we talk about another character, the guy by the name of Joseph, he's you know kind of the poster child for uh, having everything go wrong so that it can go completely right. But we follow him, and I think it's included in scriptures for this very purpose, to give us that assurance of faith that I'm sure there were times in Joseph's life in those 13 years when he went from being uh, rejected by his brothers, taken captive, uh, moved to a strange land, uh, made a slave, and then after being enslaved, being betrayed again and put in prison, and then getting to prison and being betrayed again by the men who failed to make mention of him to the Pharaoh. Um, all of that you know, could have been things that could have easily defeated and destroyed him. And I think that's the thing that uh, is part of the story. It's not really elucidated a lot in the text, but it's got to be there. Because Joseph is a person, was a person just like you and me, with the same kind of emotions, the same feelings, and the same desire. He didn't want to be a slave. He didn't want to be a prisoner. Um, the life expectancy for slaves and prisoners in Egypt was only about 25, maybe to 30 years at best, depending on what kind of work or situation they're in, especially those who were in prison. Because if you were in prison, it meant you continued to be a slave, but you had to do the most unthankful and unwelcome and hardest and most difficult and dangerous deeds. So here he is in the worst of situations. He goes from the most favored child of his parents to the worst of situations. And then God uses all that to break him down, to bring a brokenness and humility uh, I think about how that 
Micah said that the things that God wants us to know, most importantly, is to do justice, uh, to love mercy, and walk humbly before our God. And I think all of those things happen in Joseph's life. He came to recognize the importance of justice because he was subjected to injustice. I mean, that's the only way you begin to really recognize how valuable justice is when you see yourself or others being treated unjustly and you see the harm that it does. That's where, secondly, you realize that showing mercy to people who have been sorely afflicted, rejected, or who are repentant and apologetic is something that God loves. And to know that God loves to show mercy and for you to show mercy is really important because there will come points in your life where you need to be shown mercy. And when you go to God and say, you are God who finds the cry for mercy irresistible. That's such an encouragement to my heart because I don't have any fear of going to God and saying, Lord, be merciful to me, forgive me for my sins and change me. Because I know that he's a God who is ready to do that. He's anxious. He's in a way, been, I've been waiting for you to ask me so that he could bless us. And that's where I think that last of all, he, he said to, to walk humbly. That humility where I understand that I am under him and that everything that transpires in my life has his fingerprints all over it. And what I need to do is begin to be confident and believe in God. Your hand is in this moment. Your hand is in these circumstances, and I trust you. And that's where I think it's interesting in Hebrews 11, 3, that um, uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about the people who followed God throughout the scriptures, and many of them went through suffering. He said, and the way they did it, he says, they confessed uh, that they were pilgrims and strangers upon the earth. And it's really interesting to me because their confession, the word here is homo legeo in the Greek. It means they have the same thought in mind. They agree with God. And that's what submission is often translated. This word homo legeo is often translated as submission because it means that I have come to an agreement with God. I put myself under his will, that I'm no longer arguing with him. So when it says in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he's just and faithful to forgive me. The word confess there is homologeo, that I acknowledge, I come to an agreement. I, I look at God's judgment of me as a sinner and maybe in certain ways of saying, you sinned in this conversation. You sinned in this attitude. You sinned in your treatment as per person. Um, That at that point, I receive that conviction. I say, Lord, I agree with what you're saying, and I agree that it's true. Not to be like Adam and Eve who are trying to hide behind the trees or trying to cover it up with fig leaves or, you know, whatever the things they do. Instead, when God says, what have you done? Instead of projecting and pointing at Eve and saying, the woman that you gave me, and then she in turn points to the serpent, uh, the truth of the matter is, They believed a lie, and they chose to believe a lie. They knew what God's word said. They chose to reject what God had told them and to embrace what the serpent had said to them. And the only way to be free with that was to honestly say, we have sinned. We have eaten the forbidden fruit. And that's where I think that this is a point for for humans. It's so hard for us to come to that, that agreement with God that, Lord, this is who I am. And part of that agreement, he says, we recognize that we are strangers. Xenos in the Greek here is you're a foreigner. And that what that means is you have no share in the inheritance of the place that you're in. You have no rights and no privileges. I mean, when I go to a foreign country, I don't act as if I'm a citizen because I'm not. I'm there by permission and I'm required to submit to their laws and their rules and their regulations. And so I found even in countries that were very adversarial towards Christians, I had to really figure out, okay, what's the pathway that doesn't violate their laws and that makes it something that I can do? And that's kind of the idea that I don't, I'm not looking to settle here. This is only a place that I'm passing through. In fact, he says specifically that we're pilgrims upon the earth. Uh, literally, uh, a literal translation that would be a stranger in a strange land. That the more you walk with God, the more you become conformed to the image of Christ, the more strange this world, even on this country, looks to you. And I would say that for many of us, we're watching this country go in a direction that is so strange, sick, and wrong, uh, and, and it's grievous to us. And yet at the same time, we have to understand that whether a culture moves away from God, it becomes a place that we're estranged from. We don't fit in that culture anymore. 
And I remember my my parents and my my in-laws when they were getting older, since my father-in-law who lived to be 100, and he just said, I can't relate to this world anymore. I don't understand how this world works anymore. And he felt like a stranger in a strange place. And actually, as Christians, I'm not saying we need to become technologically ignorant, but at the same time, we realize that the values of the culture are strange and contrary to the values of heaven. And so that estrangement is a natural feeling and emotion. And what we're actually asking people, we're inviting them to migrate away. Uh, I have kids that live in Nashville in the area of Tennessee, and, and my cousin lives in, in Knoxville. Um, and uh, they left California because California was getting so bizarre. And, and I can't blame them, but I was challenged recently by someone who said, you know, don't desert uh, the state of Washington just because it's becoming so ungodly uh, and is run by such wicked and evil people. Rather, see yourself as somebody who is living in exile like the children of Israel did. And I, I thought about, you know, I didn't have to have that inducement to say to stay where I am because I know I'm where God wants me to be. But it was just kind of an encouragement to say, yeah, I feel like I'm a stranger. I feel like I'm a pilgrim. I feel like I don't fit in with the culture. But God has called me. He's placed me here just as he did Abraham when he brought him from Haran and the culture and the family that he knew into the land of Canaan. It said he went to a place that he did not know, which had religious patterns that were completely different and social patterns that were completely different from what he even knew uh, in the land of uh, Haran up in uh, modern day Lebanon. So. If you feel like you you don't connect with the culture, God bless you because you need you're here to connect with Christ, and as you connect with Christ, you'll find that other people will come to be drawn to you because they don't connect with the culture either. Well, I've gone way over my time, but thank you for hanging out, um, and we'll continue as we kind of close it up for the week in tomorrow's podcast. Blessings.